I regularly sing the praises of Sonic the Hedgehog, probably more so than any other critic. Sonic the Hedgehog is one of my favorite characters in the history of gaming, if not my absolute favorite. I love almost all of the Sonic games for my own reasons, be it quality or, well, something else. For this video, however, I will be making a case against, well, not Sonic, but Sega themselves and their ownership of their mascot. Once again, this video is sponsored by NordVPN, and you can get four months free with a three-year subscription by using my discount code. Everything you need is in the description below, so check it out. All right, onwards. Sonic is Sega's mascot and remains one of gaming's largest, most time-worn mascots with a near three-decade-long history. However, the character is no stranger to controversy, often seen as something of a gaming runt nowadays, after one stage aping even Mario. In spite of all this, Sonic is a truly beloved character with a very devoted and vocal fanbase. In this video, I'll be researching five pivotal moments in Sonic the Hedgehog's history where Sega have demonstrated that they do not deserve Sonic the Hedgehog as their mascot and have displayed poor conduct as a business toward their developers. Now to set the record straight, there are games in here that I have played and enjoyed. If anything, I am biased for Sonic the Hedgehog. I am biased in favor of some of these games, but against that, I will be looking into their development and the, the processes that brought us some of these projects in order to decide whether I believe Sega deserves Sonic as their mascot or not. Now, this is all just my opinion at the end of the day, and I do not truly believe myself to be the judge, the jury, and the executioner of all things Sonic, I assure you my ego is not that bloated. This is more just a research task with a little point system attached. The strikes will be applied at times when Sega have made decisions that were either obviously poor or decisions that have come at a great cost for their developers. I will of course be looking for silver linings in here, which is why we have the Gold Rings of Virtue, where Sega have clearly nurtured great talent and great ideas. The five projects I'll be researching are Sonic the Hedgehog 2006, Sonic the Hedgehog 4, Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric, Sonic Mania, and Sonic Forces. So let's begin at our first stop. A pleasure to meet you at last, Princess of Soleana. never been faster. Racing through fantastic realms, battling awesome enemies, overcoming tremendous obstacles at blistering next-gen speeds. If you thought you knew blue, it's time to think faster. All right, let's do it. Sonic the Hedgehog, redefined for the next generation. November 2006. Sega, after being forced to abandon the hardware market, ventured out to be the big dog in the third-party gaming industry. But after disappointing results with Sonic Heroes and Shadow the Hedgehog, Sega were hoping to dominate as the big dog in third-party gaming for the HD era. To kickstart Sega's new reign, Yuji Naka wanted to reboot the Sonic the Hedgehog series with a similar attitude to how they handled Sonic Heroes and Shadow the Hedgehog, a strong focus on trends to keep Sonic relevant. And what did the market want at that time? Realism. Everybody was raving about the realistic graphics that could be achieved with the new generation of consoles, so the mandate for the new Sonic was to bring Sonic to the real world, complete with a redesign. Gosh, isn't it funny how history repeats itself? Sega's primary focus was the PlayStation 3 version of Sonic the Hedgehog, with plans to port the game to the Wii and the Xbox 360. Yujiro Ogawa was set to direct the game. 
Sega were truly affirmative in that they wanted a Sonic game not only to launch the PlayStation 3, but they wanted to capitalize on the early days of the Nintendo Wii as well, which was a drastically different console. When Agawa saw the specs of the Wii console, it became apparent that porting Sonic the Hedgehog to the Wii would not be possible, and that if Sega were to insist upon a Wii Sonic game, the game would need to be made completely from the ground up, and that the Wii would be unable to even begin to handle what was in store for the next-gen Sonic the Hedgehog. So, he opted to split Sonic Team into two separate teams so they would have enough manpower to remake the game for Wii. However, this would not be possible either, due to the intended size of the project, with Yujiro Ogawa opting to start a brand new Sonic title for the Wii called Sonic Wildfire, which would go on to become Sonic and the Secret Rings. Because of this, Sonic the Hedgehog no longer had a director, forcing Shun Nakamura to direct the biggest project he'd ever directed at that time, and one that perhaps he wasn't prepared for under that amount of pressure. Sega had refused to offer him support or assistance, but things went from bad to worse when Yuji Naka left Sega, leaving Nakamura nobody to turn to for assistance with handling the big new next-gen Sonic. Yuji Naka had left Sega after being promoted into far more of an administrative working position, rendering him far more distant from the creative fields that he wanted involvement with. And since Sega did not want to listen to what Yuji Naka wanted from his career, Yuji Naka went off in search of business ventures of his own, bringing many Sonic Team staff with him. As well as this, more and more staff from the next-gen Sonic team were being moved over to the Wii team, leaving the next-gen Sonic severely understaffed, and Sega offered no support with this. Their big flagship next-gen debut for their ultimate porn star, and they barely lifted a finger to actually look after him. Seriously, Sega, what in the actual hell? At Sonic Team, measures were being taken to contain the damage being done to the next-gen Sonic the Hedgehog. At the time of Sonic the Hedgehog's conception, Sega had also planned for a mythical game involving royalty, a princess, the flames of disaster, and demons. However, plans for this game were scrapped and merged with Sonic the Hedgehog as they fit the bill for what Sega wanted for Sonic in the next-gen gaming market going forward. More realistic, more epic. As well as this, the team were forced to scale back on some of the game's mechanics. The originally planned and showcased day-to-night mechanics in the stages were removed, as well as additional hub worlds, including a desert and snow hub world. As time went by, more and more content was cut from the game, meaning that the story had to constantly change to accommodate for this, which is why lines of dialogue remain in the game that don't actually fit. Another fine mess was that Sonic Team spent a very long period of time perfecting the gameplay mechanics, polishing the game with additional animations, and yet, when all had come together, this version of the game was complete, it was incredibly unstable and riddled with crashes and slowdowns. Sonic Team had no choice but to revert the gameplay engine to a previous build at the very last minute and reincorporate all of the levels and story that had been added to the later build. So, the gameplay, while it was far less refined, would at least run stable. Sonic Team simply didn't have the time to properly figure out how to incorporate all refined gameplay engine elements or fix the refined version because Sega absolutely refused to budge on the release date of the game. All in all, Sonic Team had only a year to learn the language of a brand new console and make a massive flagship next-gen title for a company that didn't care on only half a team with an inexperienced director forced into that role against his will. So the time had come. Sonic 06 had to release in whatever state it was in. And naturally, the game was ridiculed for its unrefined controls, glitches, missing content that was promised and showcased in earlier demos, and the overall tone of the game and the treatment of Sonic within it. So, Sonic in the real world? Sonic in a romantic relationship with a human? Now, to be honest, I think some of this was just inevitable because of market demand. I can understand why Sega wanted to go in a realistic direction with Sonic to meet market trends in the early days of the modern console market. However, this obviously served as a dated betrayal of what Sonic once was before, with a lack of the visual flair and spunky attitude that once represented this franchise before. As for Sonic in a romantic relationship with a human princess, to be honest, this is not as unfounded as people make it out to be. 
cartoon animals dating humans was nothing new. Look at Roger Rabbit, for instance. The problem is that Sonic executed this with total sincerity and took it seriously. If the game had maintained the mischievous tongue-in-cheek outlook that previous games had used and blended it with this real-world setting, as opposed to going for the serious and epic route, and at least were a bit more of a babe-like character, this wouldn't have strayed too far from Sonic's original concept with Sonic dating a human called Madonna in the early development of Sonic the Hedgehog 1. Therefore, just staying true to the relatively safe trope of the rad animated animal dating a human. While I applaud Nakamura and Sonic Team for their bravery, Sega deserve all the ridicule in the world for this and how they treated their staff and their mascot here. Sonic 06 is Strike 1. Fast forward to 2008, I am giving Sega a gold ring because they have demonstrated an awareness that their fans are wanting Sonic the Hedgehog to return to his roots in 2D by addressing this with Sonic Unleashed, a game that returns Sonic to his cartoony world populated with cartoony humans and animals while successfully pulling off a more epic sense of scope, but also sees the return of 2D gameplay. It's all there within a mostly 3D game, but the 2D gameplay would pay homage to Sonic's past. This sparks a new demand for a 2D Sonic the Hedgehog game. Fast forward to 2009, Sega have listened, earning them another gold ring. Project Needle Mouse is announced and later revealed to be Sonic the Hedgehog 4 Episode 1, due for release in 2010. It's a miracle! Sega listened to their audience and brought forth a brand new Sonic the Hedgehog game, and better yet, it's the long-awaited sequel to Sonic 3 & Knuckles, a continuation of the classic Mega Drive Sonic the Hedgehog games. But is it really though? Okay, hear me out here. For starters, Sonic was sporting his modern design, hear me out, which is something I don't really have a problem with, see? I never made the distinction between classic and modern Sonic as anything more than an art style difference until it was brought to the foreground in 2011 with Sonic Generations. Sonic rocking his modern look for Sonic the Hedgehog 4 was not a problem, at least not as far as I'm concerned. But the attitude behind it was, with Takeshi Azuka implying that classic Sonic would be impossible to market today, and that he would alienate newcomers to the franchise. Like, what do you have against classic Sonic? What's so bad about this design? It's great, it still looks good today. That's kind of a weird attitude to hold towards your mascot when in a more simplistic art style. I can understand why people were disappointed by this, as it meant that Sonic 4 wouldn't be quite as authentic of a sequel to its predecessor as one may have expected, but hey hey, at least we're getting a Sonic the Hedgehog 4. The other fundamental issue is why was it an episodic release? I mean, why would it be? Why would the sequel to Sonic the Hedgehog 1, 2, 3 and Knuckles be episodic. The developers of the game were dimps, as opposed to Sonic Team, which wasn't the worst idea in the world, I guess. After all, they did develop Sonic Advance. However, Sonic's gameplay engine was far closer to Sonic Rush, complete with a homing attack. Not the worst prospect in the world, but again, it would detract from the authenticity of this being a follow-up to Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Sega commissioned the game with only four levels, just four all of which being nostalgic homages to previous iconic Sonic levels. The structure was overall a greatest hits compilation of the previous Sonic levels and bosses, things that players would immediately associate with Sonic. So we had Green Hill Zone, Casino Night Zone, Labyrinth Zone, Metropolis Zone, and a final boss aboard the Death Egg, each with their respective bosses. But this is supposed to be a sequel. Well, they just renamed them. Splash Hill, Casino Street, Lost Labyrinth, Mad Gear, and Egg Station. One would expect more from the sequel to Sonic 3 and Knuckles than an off-brand knockoff of nostalgic zones from the past. 
Sonic 3 and Knuckles introduced a lot of innovations to the Sonic the Hedgehog series, with additional playable characters, elemental shields that would give Sonic different abilities, cutscenes, mini bosses, and the ability for Sonic to play around with a goalpost for bonuses, continuous Act 1 to 2 structure, larger levels, bonus stages. Sonic the Hedgehog 4 would not expand upon or add to these innovations, but instead completely omit them altogether. Imagine boasting that your new game is the long-awaited sequel to one of the most iconic game trilogies of all time without researching beyond the fundamental level of the first two of them. And with that, Sonic the Hedgehog 4 Episode 1 was not an authentic follow-up to Sonic 3 and Knuckles. However, it was, of course, only the first installment to the saga. Sonic the Hedgehog 4 Episode 2 released two years after in 2012, and it did address the way Sonic handled for the sake of making him feel a bit more authentic to the original trilogy. As well as this, graphically speaking, Sonic the Hedgehog 4 Episode 2 was a lot more interesting to look look at than its predecessor, switching from the 2D artwork that mimics 3D models to a fully 2.5D game, so it barely even feels like an authentic episode 2 at this point, more of a sequel, more of a Sonic the Hedgehog 5. The very same problem with the nostalgia baiting levels instead of original ones persisted with Sonic the Hedgehog 4 episode 2, with Sonic and this time Tails running through aquatic ruin, ice cap, oil ocean, wing fortress and the death egg once more, but once again, renamed knockoffs called Sylvania Castle, White Park, Oil Desert, Sky Fortress, and Death Egg Mark II. They did at least introduce original boss fights this time because they were really trying just that little bit harder to make the knockoffs a bit more convincing. One returning feature from Sonic 3 and Knuckles was the more involving use of cutscenes to see levels through a little bit more. Sonic the Hedgehog 4 Episode 2 has a little bit more of a story going on which piggybacks off of Sonic CD, going so far as to retroactively refer to Sonic CD as the beginning of the Sonic 4 saga in marketing. Dr. Eggman has resurrected Metal Sonic and encased the little planet in the new Death Egg 2, and is up to Sonic and Tails to, well, not really rescue it, but to cut the power and defeat Eggman, I guess, right? Imagine being the kind of hero that doesn't save anyone, but beats up the villain. Sonic the Hedgehog 4 boasts another returning feature from Sonic 3 and Knuckles. As many know, Sonic 3 and Knuckles is what you get if you lock Sonic the Hedgehog 3 into the Sonic and Knuckles lock-on cartridge. You get a mashup of both games into one singular story that was intended, with the addition of being able to play as Tails and Knuckles throughout the entire game. Sonic the Hedgehog 4 Episode 2 boasts lock-on technology. So, does this mean that when you own both Sonic the Hedgehog 4 Episode that the two mash up and make one game, and this retrospectively fixes the physics of Sonic the Hedgehog 4 Episode 1 and allows Tails to appear in that game too? <laughs> no, you silly goose. It means you can unlock a four-act-long episode called Episode Metal, where you can play as Metal Sonic through slightly varied acts from Sonic 4 Episode 1 in a different order. And that's it. That's all, folks. Yeah, that's not really how lock-on technology works. Also, no, Tails is not playable. He's there to assist Sonic when prompted, and he has a new attack move and his flight ability. Here's the thing. Sonic the Hedgehog 4 altogether, these aren't bad games. Not enough for me to give another gold ring of virtue to, but they're not bad. I think they could have been at least fairly well received as the first fully 2D Sonic games in a little while if they didn't call them Sonic the Hedgehog 4. You can't just commission a follow-up to the original Sonic the Hedgehog trilogy without researching what people actually liked about them. The Sonic the Hedgehog 4 saga was the result of Sega's hubris, believing that the fans would simply accept the game just because it's 2D. And that being 2D gives the game birthright to be associated with the original trilogy of Sonic games. So does Sonic the Hedgehog 4 Episode 2 get a strike? Well, honestly, it's hard to say. The games turned out okay, nothing incompetent like Sonic the Hedgehog 06, and there were no majorly dire circumstances for the developers at DIMPS. It's just pretty evident that this whole thing was a poorly researched, half-assed cash grab rather than a Sonic the Hedgehog 4. So for that, I'm gonna give it half a strike. Just for them being so wrong-minded about an otherwise fairly simple task. Let's fast forward again.
this time to 2014's Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric and the production leading up to it, Sega had a mandate. They wanted to reboot Sonic the Hedgehog without rebooting Sonic the Hedgehog. Well, that in itself deserves a strike, really, doesn't it? Sega wanted two divisions working on two separate versions of Sonic the Hedgehog and his respective world. They wanted to continue having Sonic Team work on Sonic games for Japan, which are Sonic as we'd by then know him, smaller scale stories staying very true to their roots, while the daring and bold reboot would be far bigger and with more of a focus on story and character. So, here's how this looks to me, a cynic. Sega basically wanted to leave the Japanese modern Sonic to continue playing it safe and puttering along with smaller games following the same old formula, while having a separate version of Sonic for the USA to take the risks to basically just be a breeding ground for bigger and more experimental ideas in case they fail, and that way any failures don't affect their main mascot, the modern Sonic. That is just my take on this. USA Sonic takes the risks while Japanese Sonic just kind of exists. This fundamental concept is honestly just laughable. I'm just saying, it kind of deserves a strike. Either you involve your brand or you don't. Don't just pussyfoot around, never taking any leaps and blame any misfire on another dimension, what the fuck is wrong with you? So the project was sent off to Big Red Button, who were tasked with rebooting Sonic the Hedgehog based upon the creative vision of Big Red Button founder, Bob Raffae, who had previously worked as a creative director on such classics as Crash Bandicoot and Jack and Daxter, and Sonic and his respective world and all of his friends would be completely overhauled with radical redesigns. As well as this, Sega's mandate was for Sonic Synergy, the new project, to have more of a focus on the origins of Sonic, skilled based platforming, discovery, exploration and co-op, as opposed to such a strong focus on speed because we all know that Sonic as we know him just can't ever do any of those things, right? So let me get this straight, it would basically be a Sonic Adventure game, something the fans have been asking for for like a decade by this point, but apparently that's too un-Sonic for Sonic, so it needs to be a different Sonic. You're testing me, you are testing me. I'm trying to hold on to my strikes right now, but you are testing me. Sega had asked Big Red Button to target next-gen systems for their Sonic reboot project, which meant the PC, PS4, and the Xbox One, with the gameplay engine set to be CryEngine 3, to handle the gorgeous new visuals required for a very lavish new Sonic reboot. Not a typical engine for the time by any means, this required a lot of very specialist talent to master. Fortunately, Big Red Button had just that and got to work at a good, steady pace with things looking optimistic. Once the so far completed work had been demonstrated to Sega and Sonic Team headed by Takashi Izuka, they started to make a long list of demands for the game which contradicted the previous commissions and already established components stating that Big Red Button's vision of Sonic was just too different to Sonic as we know him and loved him. So, Sega commissioned a daring reboot of Sonic where the whole point of its existence was to be daring and radically different to Sonic as we know and love him, but upheaved the entire project because it was daring and radically different to Sonic as we know him and love him. Oh my god! Sega just... What the fuck? Sega's criticisms were that the game was too slow and methodical, requiring more sections devoted to speed. The designs for the characters that they approved were no longer okay, and they wanted all the underwater segments of the game to be removed, because Sonic must never touch water without dying. You know, like in Labyrinth Zone. I'm doing my best to withhold my strikes for now, but I'm not giving out any gold rings for this. The storyline had to be changed too, as Sega felt it conflicted with their own plans for the Japanese version. They didn't want the USA Sonic's origins to be told, as they felt like they could tackle that for the Japanese version someday. You know what that means? More classic Sonic is on the way. So the story had to be redone entirely. No longer about the origins of Sonic and Dr. Robotnik's rivalry, but now about Sonic taking on a killer lizard. The game was also set to include a variety of new characters, including Cliff and Percy. Cliff was formerly an inventor of gadgetry for Sonic and his team, but this aspect was stripped from his character because Sega only permits two inventor type characters, being Tails and Dr. Robotnik. Sega actually have pretty strict guidelines when it comes to Sonic, including, but not limited to, 
to, Sonic is never allowed to show emotion. Neither are any of his friends. No kind of enhanced emotion anyway. He must be optimistic. But he can never be overjoyed and he can never cry. That's really weird. Heck, did you know that Dick Animation once got into massive trouble with Sega for having Sonic cry after finding the roboticized Uncle Chuck? What a really strange guideline. A character called Percy was also removed from the core of the game because Amy must be the girl character, I guess. I don't quite really know so much about that one, really. But little did Big Red Button know that behind the scenes at Sega, they were doing something truly insidious that would affect them in an extremely averse way. Sega had struck a deal with animation studio Weedo to make a Sonic cartoon set in a newly rebooted universe. Not the universe of Sonic Synergy, but yet another separate take on it with new concepts. But to avoid oversaturating the Sonic universe market, Sega comes along bringing these concepts to Big Red Button. And those guys must have been thinking, Oh god, surely not. Sega, surely, surely not. Yep. Sega were now telling Big Red Button to re-overhaul their overhaul to overhaul it with the vision of Wido and Sega's collaboration, changing Sonic Synergy to Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric. Now guys, remember in April 2019 when Paramount Pictures revealed their new realistic Sonic the Hedgehog and after ridicule across the board from literally everyone, they went back and had the nightmare of changing that design and reanimating Sonic in the film all over again, but also remember how it was due to audience ridicule and the deadline for the movie was delayed accommodating for it? That's a luxury compared to what Big Red Button had to deal with. Sega, who asked specifically for one thing, making brand deals behind their back, leading to enforced changes from what they asked for and not extending the deadline. This is worse than what Sega pulled with Sonic Team on Sonic 06, and what comes next is where matters get really, really bleak. So Sega had caused a lot of work for Big Red Button in forcing them to overhaul their project due to a brand new deal made behind their backs that they had no say in. But as well as this, Sega had struck the exclusivity deal with Nintendo, which meant that Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric could not legally be released on the consoles it was made entirely for with a very, very specific engine. So they had to delay the game until after the Nintendo Nintendo deal expired. No, I'm joking. They forced Big Red Button to port the game to the Wii U and scrap the next gen versions. The Wii U being a console with a radically different architecture to consoles that the game was made for, and the Wii U could not support the Cry Engine 3. This deal also had a time restriction, which meant that the game needed to be delivered by 2014, giving Big Red Button under a year to completely overhaul the game for the Wii U. So like with Sonic the Hedgehog 06, this led to cutbacks, cut content, cut graphical features, cut story duration, cut multiplayer features, and yes, they had to cut a version of the Chow Garden. Man, so many cuts, the UK government's getting jealous. Now when Sega first announced the project with the trailer for it, they showed footage and features from the original Cry Engine 3 version of the game, but with a disclaimer that this was an earlier build. Therefore, kinda making some promises to the audience that would never pay off due to cuts. Sega is officially the UK government. Well, it shows how much they respect their market, doesn't it? With the gameplay engine now changed from the Cry Engine 3, Sega had to set Big Red Button into crunch time, working over the legal limit of hours and at times with no pay. Porting from Cry Engine 3 to Wii U architecture was a feat that absolutely no game studio ever had achieved, and it took a lot of work and a few phone calls to Crytek, which I imagine went like this. Crytek support, how can we help? Yeah, we need to port this game from Cry Engine 3 to Wii U architecture. Uh, well, I don't think that's possible. No, but if we don't, we'll get sued. By who exactly? Sega. 
Okay, do you need me to call the police? Is Sega in the room with you right now? So Crytek had to develop a very special version of their engine for Big Red Button to use, thus saving the project about as much as was possible. An engine that would never again be used afterwards. Because of how much crunch was underway to meet the deadline, Big Red Button could not approach any new projects in that time, be it DLC or a follow-up. So to cut costs, up to 50 people had to lose their jobs. That's 50 people losing their livelihood because of Sega. Right, we may have gotten a bad game, but imagine you're as happy as Larry, working your dream job in the creative industry, and then your client makes a load of deals behind your back that you have no say in, that destroy all of your hard work, and you do your best to salvage it, only to lose that job and your source of income. And it's all Sega's fault. This is not just a bad game. This is unforgivable. This is half a studio left behind. Sega leveled half of an independent studio. They thanos Big Red Button. And yes, the game was released. And it's a mess. It doesn't work. You know the rest. But luckily for Sega, it doesn't affect their legacy because Sonic Boom is not Sonic. It's a totally different thing. Wait, shit, look at this. Of course it affected their legacy. It pissed away the credibility of Sonic once again and was a total repeat of Sonic 06's troubled production, only worse. Jesus Christ, Sega. Jesus Christ, I don't even care that the game is bad, but you guys screwed over Big Red Button disgracefully. By some miracle, Big Red Button managed to survive and are still developing games today, so that's good. I feel like I should just say, for Sonic Boom Rise of Lyrics, Sega gets a strike for a dumb idea, a strike for screwing Big Red Button around in the first place, a strike for letting the Weedo deal affect the project, a strike for screwing them over with the Nintendo deal, and 50 strikes for every job lost in the process, and an extra strike for almost ruining an independent company. If I were to roll with this, Sega would get 56.5 strikes against them for just two gold rings. But if I were to do that, it would mean that this one singular project for the sake of this video would completely negate all of the good that Sega has ever done for Sonic the Hedgehog in their time with him, rendering this research task nothing more than a pummeling landslide. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give them a strike for having no faith in the Sonic brand to the point where they'd create a new brand just for being experimental. And I'm gonna give them a strike for the fact that they screwed over Big Red Button so badly. And I'm gonna give them a strike for their sheer ineptitude in game development as to thinking that you could port something from the CryEngine 3 to Wii U architecture, which currently leaves the tally at 4.5 strikes and two gold rings. Maybe we'll find some virtue from Sonic and Sega in Sonic's 25th anniversary. And we'll be starting with Sonic Mania. So I'm going to give Sega a gold ring here for recruiting passionate fans to work on a Sonic game officially. I'm also going to give Sega a gold ring for taking such pride in the work of these fans with the YouTube content. And two gold rings for bringing Hyper Potions and T-Lopes back on board for Team Sonic Racing, which brings the gold ring total to six. And another gold ring for putting Tyson Hess forward to help with the Sonic movie redesign which brings us to seven, which have been bought by Sega showing such pride in the Mania team, fans who know Sonic really, really well. But it turns out, Sega did attempt to pull a fast one with the Mania team, as when they commissioned Sonic Mania, they commissioned only a four level duration, like with the individual Sonic 4 episodes, which earned Sega a strike. The Mania team, led by Christian Whitehead, fed back to Tagashi Azuka, requesting more levels, and Izuka fed this back to Sega. Sega agreed to allow additional levels, which earns them a gold ring, but those levels had to be recreations of existing Sonic levels, including Green Hill and Chemical Plant. Okay, I'm gonna say it, that's a strike again. Which currently has the strikes at 6.5 and the gold rings at 7, so Sega still aren't doing too badly here. And you know what? The game was great, so it all paid off and that earned Sega, so that brings Sega their 8th gold ring. Moving on over to Sonic Team's side of the 25th anniversary, after 3 years of toying around with concepts, Sonic Team were given 1 year to actually develop Sonic Forces, with the development beginning in 2016. 
which was Sonic's 25th anniversary year, meaning that Sonic's 25th anniversary game would fall after the 26th anniversary. So I'm applying a strike there for ill preparation and timing. Like, that's just silly, they had all the time in the world for this. Now, while Sega had commissioned an entire authentic classic Sonic game with Sonic Mania, Sega still insisted upon the inclusion of Classic Sonic in Sonic Forces, with a very rushed version of Classic Sonic running on a 3D engine that just doesn't work. And Takashi Azuka's excuse was, you cannot make Classic Sonic work using 3D assets, which we all know is bullshit because the Sonic fan remix does it. Not to mention, Sonic Generations did it better. So there's a strike for that. When it came to the overall project, only three developers were allocated to level design, with only one of them having any prior experience working on Sonic games, and that single game being Sonic Lost World. So another strike for completely ill-staffing the level design department. The game was released and it pissed away every last bit of newfound street cred Sonic had earned over the prior 10 years, proving that we can't even rely on boost gameplay and classic Sonic for a good time anymore. So another strike for that. The Avatar creation was fun though, so another gold ring. In total, Sega gets 10.5 strikes and 9 gold rings of virtue. Now I do stand by that there are plenty more cases that can be made for Sega's ownership of Sonic, which is why I was a little bit more lenient with Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric than I felt like being, otherwise they would have rounded this off with 62.5 strikes. Sega's dealings with Sumo Digital and the Sega All-Stars series as well as Team Sonic Racing have been successful. The original Sonic trilogy was great, I love the adventure games, Sonic Unleashed was absolutely superb. Sonic Colors won the trust of the public back. There have been times when Sega have known how to pull a rabbit out of the hat with great developers and great management, but I for one would love to see a new team handle Sonic and be able to trust that there would be no detrimental intervention from Sega. Imagine if Big Red Button were able to simply run free with Sonic Synergy. Imagine what we could have had there. For now, it certainly appears apparent that Sega could be the one restricting Sonic more than anybody else, and they need a drastic change of attitude before we can ever hope to be blown away by Sonic again. Maybe a change of ownership would be what Sonic needs to be on top all over again. The trouble with Sega is they're capable hands, but they're just not trustworthy, which makes it hard for me to believe that they truly deserve one of the greatest mascots in history. Well, what do you guys think? Comment below and discuss, and as always if you enjoyed this video and you want to see more like it, don't forget to hit subscribe, hit the like button, and in the description below are the links to my Patreon and my Twitter. Thank you so much for watching guys, and have a great day. That's a cute outfit. Did your husband give it to you? Because you could get a way better costume from Zentai Zone. Check out their range of custom made tailored superhero costumes. Ridiculously good quality, value and customization. Link is in the description below as well as my coupon code channel pup where you can get a discount off of your purchase. And while you're at it, why not get your suit designed by my talented buddy Dan from New Blood Dan's Workshop. You can contact him via the link in the description below. Seriously guys, you do not want to miss out on your chance to be your favorite superhero and feel authentic and professional. And you don't want to miss out on that Channel Pup discount. Can you feel the sunshine? Does it brighten?